Sometimes finding the perfect hobby space is a hard thing to do. Hey everyone, welcome back to the table. I'm Scott, and today we're going to talk about hobby space. So our goal with this video is to help you figure out your space. It doesn't mean finding the perfect space, but making your space work for you. The first and I think the most important question is, what brings you joy in, for your hobby? That could be as simple as you like painting, you like wargaming, you like building, you like doing all the above, maybe you like collecting. So understanding what that is is going to be a major driver and what are your motivations for your space. So th question number two that I like to ask and along the same lines is what is your goal? What are you planning on doing? Where do you see yourself in five years? It sounds kind of like a job interview. And you know what part of it is? It's your hobby job interview. What do you want to be doing in a couple of years, right? Do you see yourself with this big old army that you've built up and painted and whatever? Well, where are you going to put that army? How are you going to be able to get to there? To get started, we need to break things down into basic areas. Type of area number one is the transitional area. This could be as simple as, you know, a desk that is in the corner that is multi-purpose that you're using things for. It could be a kitchen table. It could also be going to a local gaming store and painting or building there or even playing games there as well. So those are really good examples of a transitional area. The key thing here is that whatever you're doing is not there and it's not permanent on any level whatsoever. It brings me to space number two, which is the flex space. And so flex space is something that could be a desk, but you have some things already set up and it's okay for them to be there. You might not have enough space to be able to put everything you want to do in that particular area, but you have enough of it that it gets you most of the way there and it makes it that much easier to transition into hobby mode. The third type of space is the static or dedicated space. And that's usually hard to come by. A lot of times it could be a hobby room if you're lucky enough to have one of those, or maybe it's a room in a basement or an attic or some place maybe in your house that you can have a dedicated hobby space. Now these things are fantastic and the major qualifier for this is that you can have a project, you can set it up, you can walk away, come back a couple days later or even a week later and your stuff is still there ready for you to go. Things are is easily accessible and you have defined areas within that space. Now before we get too far in the rest of this list, I wanna remind you to like and subscribe if you haven't done it already. And if you think of any of these things that I might have missed or you want to see more of it as I'm going through this, put a comment down below. Now that we've identified the different spaces, the next thing that we need to do is to find the types of activities that happen in these spaces. Probably the number one activity that people are doing is painting. And so I'm going to break this down into a couple subcategories. Category number one is going to be brush painting. Brush painting in a transitional type space Usually what you're going to have is some type of container that you can carry around your paints in, potentially even a carrying case. Um, Citadel and a bunch of other companies, they make specific like boxes that you can put your paints into so you can carry them around. I'll see people have them just simply in boxes. Now there's some other tools that you can use. Um, one of my favorites is this Paint Pal and it's a 3D printable um, container that you can stack them in and you can put different types of either models or bits or paint or brushes or different types of tools within that area. And there's a lot of other type of things along this lines that you can do if you have access to a 3D printer or you're willing to invest a little bit of money in buying some kind of carrying case. And I think that works really well from a transitional standpoint. Now from a flex standpoint, one of the things that you can do is you can utilize some of the same tools from your transitional type stuff. So your boxes, your containers, your whatever. And maybe you're putting those in a drawer so then you can simply pull those out or open up the drawer and use them when you're ready. And so you're not quite completely committed to setting out paint racks, for example, but you do have some things available quite quickly. So this will kind of transition over into the static space. So static space and kind of the flex space era is setting up some type of paint racks that you can stack up your paints on. There's a couple different ways you can do this. And way number one is having some type of vertical rack. Now these are the ones I prefer because if you have some type of desktop rack where you're lining them up and you're, you're basically creating like a depth of paint, one of the issues with that is that you're taking up the space that you could be using for painting or other activities. Generally my rule is 
the less space you have, the higher you need to go. Now, nail polish racks are probably the easiest thing to use to be able to put paints because the nail polish racks, the bottles for those are very similar in size to the bottles that we use for our paints. So you can easily purchase those on maybe Amazon or find them some other place and you're able to you know, mount them to the wall and stack them up. Now that being said, one of the things that I think is really neat when I look at some other painters is that they have racks that go completely around them here and they have their painting space right here um, in the middle and they can easily grab whatever paint they want off of the rack and put it back. For us specifically, the way we do our paints is we actually have all our paints here on the wall. And the reason we do that is there could be three or four of us painting at the same time. And so having the paints crowded around one particular person, people are generally going in and interrupting them while they're trying to paint, which isn't necessarily the greatest idea in a group setting. So we like to have ours displayed on the wall and that way easily they can go up and pick what they want. Some of the other things that you should consider with brush painting are what's your accessibility to water? For us down here, we don't really have access to running water um, or a bucket. We'd have to go all the way upstairs to be able to do that. So we utilize um, jugs of water and we have a slop bucket is what I call it. It's just a two gallon bucket that we can dump our waste into. And then when that gets full enough, we take it upstairs and dispose of it. <clears throat> Moving on to the next part of painting is airbrush or rattle can painting. Now those are two different types of things but they have a similar theme. The theme is that typically when you're spraying them the dust or the fumes can be um, can be very intrusive to your space and it can coat things or it could simply stink you out of the room in the case of a rattle can. And really it's not that safe to breathe in some of those particulates. So now typically these are usually either a static or a transitional. Usually there's not a lot of flex space that's happening here, but there can be. So from a transitional standpoint, go outside back and you can spray and then you can bring the model in and let it dry in a space where it's not going to stink everybody out. Now the important thing is that it needs to be a certain temperature. So the downside about spraying things with like a rattle can or for using an airbrush in an outside environment is if it's too cold, it's not going to the paint's not going to cure correctly or all the way. And if it's too hot or humid, it's not gonna cure quite there. So that's one of the downsides to that transitional space. And honestly, that's one of the reasons I have switched over to using an airbrush to do all my priming, along with a lot of other things beyond that. But that's why I use an airbrush for priming myself because I can have something, I can have a, a booth set up that I can paint things inside the booth. Now that works out great, except when I'm building giant dioramas and I need to spray the whole thing and it won't fit inside of it. So one of the neat things about some of the booths, and now we consider that more of a static space item, is that they usually come with a turntable and they have some type of ventilation built into them. And you don't necessarily have to hook it up to an outside area. They have filter, a double filter or some type of filtering system that'll prevent the spray from going outside of the booth. Another really important thing, no matter what space you have, is you need to have good lighting. Lighting is key to a good hobby space. Now, there's a lot of different types of lighting, but one of the important things I want to make known here is sunlight is not a good substitute for good lighting. One, you can only do it during certain times of the day. And two, that light isn't always reliable in the way that you can have consistent coloring for your paint. You could be painting in the morning and then paint in the afternoon or paint in the middle of the day and your colors and how you perceive them are gonna change throughout the day because the sun is setting and coming up and going down and, and really changing the way that is. So I suggest having something as simple as an extra lamp or there's a lot of other things that you can do that will be consistent and reliable in how you're painting. Um, but I like to use some of these lamps that we have floating around that you can easily adjust the, the brightness of them and they're on like an articulating arm that you can move around. You could have something that's portable that sits on the desk that works. Um, or the other thing that you can do is simply buy a lantern that sits on the table that provides enough light. <clears throat> the next type of activity I wanna talk about is wargaming. Wargaming is its own kind of unique thing um, in a way because it one, it depends on what kind of game you're playing. If you're playing an epic scale game, you might need a little less space. If you're playing a bigger game, maybe it's um, maybe you're playing Warhammer and 
you need about a four foot by six foot space to be able to play that. Now, there's a lot of different ways, as we mentioned, from the transitional aspect, you know, going to your local gaming store or simply putting, taking over part of the kitchen table or dining room table to build a play a game works out quite well. Um, the downside about that is you have constraints in how long you have to actually play and depending on when you get there. I can't count the number of times that I've gone to a hobby store hoping that I can get a game in really quick and not being able to finish the game or rushing the very end of the game to find out who the winner is right before they're getting ready to close and they're kicking us out the door. And there's a lot of different options for more of a static type wargaming table. You definitely can buy one. There's a lot of people that are more than happy to sell you a wargaming table. You can also set up a couple folding tables with a piece of wood or some type of mat over the top of it just to keep the models from falling through the cracks. And that can work out really well too. You don't have to invest in a big table. Or if you're crafty enough and have some woodworking skills, then you can you build your own table. And the table that we have here, we actually built this and it's eight foot by four foot. And we simply framed around the outside of it with two by six. And then we have a couple supports in the middle, similar to the way you would have a bed. And then we simply put a piece of plywood over it. And the reason why I made it four foot by eight foot is so that I did not have to cut the piece of plywood. The other thing too, is you can set up some folding tables. Um, during the summer months when it's a little warmer, we have gone and set up some folding tables out in the garage and had kind of like a mini tournament, if you will, out there. And that works out well enough too. So there's a lot of options there. Folding tables are probably one of the most perfect things that you can use for these types of things. And a lot of times is one of the things that they use during tournaments. Next activity is displaying your models. So the static space for displaying models, if you look behind me, there's a whole bunch of shelves. So we had a bunch of leftover shelves as we got newer furniture. I would call it grown up furniture, if you will. <laughs> I took a IKEA shelf, took two L brackets, and then put a piece of plexiglass in between those to split the, split the space up. So now instead of one shelf where there's this giant rear gap in between, between the top of the models and the top of the shelf, I now have two shelves that I can put models on. And that works for just about every single model. And the models that don't work, I put them on top, as you can see right here. But the other nice thing about doing something like this is that it allows us to build a setup or stage potentially armies or list on these particular pieces of plexiglass, pull them off of the shelf, and then be able to play a game with them. And then we can put them back on as they maybe get destroyed or as we're done playing with them during a game. And then we can easily put them back onto the shelf. So it makes cleanup easy. Now, one of the tricks with plexiglass is if you want to use plexiglass and you're not comfortable cutting it yourself, a lot of times the hardware store will cut them for you on request. And sometimes that can actually be cheaper. That's one way to do it. Now, if we go to more of the transitional era, era, there's a lot of different ways to display your models. One of the biggest ones is buying those cases that they have out there where you can you have like a little door in the front of them. They have different racks and then you can magnetize them by putting the magnets on the bottom of your models and then putting metal on the bottom of the shelves. And then you can simply carry them wherever you want and display them however you want. A couple other things or examples that you can do with this as well is we use bins quite often to transport our models. So we'll take and put them in the bottom of bins. You can even magnetize a bin and do it that way. That works out quite well. There's a lot of 3D printable options. There's a product called the Omni 2 that I really like. We just got and we haven't printed it up all the way yet. But you can take this and actually print up different sizes and be able to customize it for your army. Um, which looks really neat and I'm excited to get onto that project. Um, other thing is you can simply use a box. There's nothing but he says you have to have this fancy device. You can go old school and use a box and that works perfectly fine too. Now another thing to consider, another activity that might happen in your hobby space is 3D printing. 3D printing typically takes some dedicated space. Now it depends on what type of printer, how much space you need. Now if it's an FDM printer, those need a little less space because you're printing that and when the print's complete, you can simply take it off of the base and then now you have a 3D print ready and you can maybe do a little trimming and you're good to go. Now if you're gonna do resin printing or SLA printing, it requires more space because not only do you have to print it, but you also have to have a way to clean it and cure it as well. And, and for us, we do a pre-rinse to it where we use more like dirtier water, more dirtier 
um, wash to clean off the model and then put it in its final wash to be able to try to save. And there's also a place where you need them to sit and kind of dry before you can before maybe you want to handle them or start curing them as well. And so that requires a decent amount of space as well. Um, especially since depending on what you're using to clean or what type of resin you're using, it can get sticky, messy, and dirty really quick. Another activity that we could be talking about is photos or and or videos. Now these are kind of two different big categories, but I'm going to lump them together anyways. Now from a photo perspective, it's probably one of the easiest areas that you could be transitional with because a lot of people have a camera with them all the time in the form of their cell phone. So their cell phone can take great pictures and you don't need a lot to take good pictures. There's a ton of articles out there on the internet, usually about once or twice a year. GW will pull up the one they made. Goonhammer has a couple good ones. And I've seen people where they just take a t-shirt, set it up on the side of a couch, put their model on it, take a picture with some decent lighting and away you go, you got a good picture. The other um, thing is something a little more permanent is maybe a photo booth. Now I have a photo booth and I really like it. One of the things I don't like about it is the thing is enormous. It is huge on a roughly about four foot cube. Now the nice part is I'm able to move things around and if I wanna do kind of a bigger photo shoot, I can put all my pieces in there and then easily transition them. So that part of it, I'm definitely not complaining. But from the size and the footprint it takes up is quite large. Now not all photo booths are that large. You can definitely find some that are smaller. Now one of the other things to consider with photos in general is getting a turntable. Now there's a couple different turntables that are out there. You can simply get one that turns manually where you can move it with your finger or something along that lines and that works out just fine too. There's a lot of electronic ones that are out there that work out quite well. We have a larger one, but I have seen somebody get creative before and use their microwave as a turntable. Obviously not with the microwave on, but they've been able to put the model in there and then they actually turn the microwave itself with their finger or the table inside the microwave itself with their finger and then take pictures of it or video of it. Two tools that I use all the time. One of them is this articulating arm that I have here that I can simply screw my camera or even put a cell phone attachment onto it and I can move it around the table and it just holds its place where it's at. Now I've tried to use the ones where you can bend them and move them all around, but those things are not very sturdy. And with the slightest bump onto the table or whatever's house, housing that thing, that thing just jiggles and bounces everywhere forever. It doesn't seem to stop, which is not very good for video. So I recommend something with more of an articulating arm like the one I'm showing you. And I was able to pick this one up off of Amazon for like 20 something bucks. So the other thing that I really, really like is this stand that you don't have to necessarily mount to a table or to a um, or clip onto a table or anything like that and this stand here you can simply lift it up you can move it you can tilt it you can turn it around and I use this thing all the time when taking video with my cell phone or taking pictures and I want to make sure that the camera is as steady as possible the other thing and the last thing I want to mention here from an area is even though we kind of covered it with display just having a place to store your stuff. I'm a big fan of bins and containers, boxes, having those available to you. One of the things we do is as we transition or change rooms, any of the older furniture, I use that. Now it happens to be a lot of IKEA furniture as we've upgraded or changed things out throughout the house. Um, using those with bins is just a perfect way to be able to store things. But if you don't have accessibility to those, boxes and bins work out quite well. Old cups or bowls work out really well, assuming they're not hazardous. And actually takeout containers is another way to store things as well. And if you're interested in some of those tips, I actually have another video that I did, uh, the tw top 12 hobby tools that you probably have laying around. Check that video out and I talk a little bit about containers you can use and some storage options there. So that about wraps everything up. Now there's probably more areas that we can go on and if there's something that caught your interest while we're going through everything, feel free to make a comment below. I'm more than happy to expand or answer questions. Our goal is always to get more people in the hobby, make sure we keep everybody having a good time and co making cool stuff. Again, figure out what it is that makes you have joy from this hobby. What is it that you want to do? Just focus on the part that you like to do the most and optimize your space to be able to do that. It's important not to try to make your space perfect. Make some changes, try them out for a while, 
and then add more. You don't have to have everything perfect before you even start using it. Your space is going to change and grow over time. So continue to do better. And until next time, when we see you at the table.